Gamera, one of Japan's most storied and cherished monsters. A monster infamous for being the box office rival to Toho's Godzilla for decades and helped shape the landscape of the kaiju genre as we know it today. Despite not being all that well known in the West, Gamera's legacy in the kaiju genre is so significant that it is likely only eclipsed by Godzilla himself. But what is it that makes this giant turtle so important? How could a monster that practically started as nothing more than a copy of Godzilla turn into one of the most beloved kaiju franchises ever made? Well, today, we're going to take a deep dive into this monster's history. From its beginnings as a movie about giant killer rats and turtles at a strip club, to what many consider some of the best kaiju movies ever made all while looking at how these movies changed the trajectory of people's lives and opened a door for them to pursue their dreams. Hello, my name is Cynical Justin, and welcome to the history and evolution of Gamera. Gamera's story begins where many kaiju stories do, with greed. <laughs> As many of you know, 1954 saw the release of Toho's massively successful Gojira, a movie that would change Japanese filmmaking forever and birth a new genre that would go on to produce hundreds of movies. The film was so successful that Toho would make a sequel, and then another, and then another, and then another, and then another. every time Toho would strike gold. They made so much cash with these movies that they firmly cemented themselves in the top five Japanese film studios with a stranglehold over the industry. Alongside Toho, you had Shochiku, Nikatsu, Toei, and Daie. For a long time, Godzilla would be all alone at the top of the food chain. No other studio would even dare to try and claim the crown of the king of the monsters. That was until president of Daie Studios, Masaichi Nagata, decided he wasn't going to let the king stand on the mountaintop forever. No, he decided that Daie was going to carry out a regicide. Founded in 1942 as Dai Nippon Film, Dai Studios had only recently come into its own. The studio gained a ton of traction after producing Akira Kurosawa's critically acclaimed Rashomon in 1950, which would enter into the 12th annual Venice International Film Festival and win the top prize of best film, and in the process, put Japanese cinema on a pedestal for all the world to see. The studio would follow up with other big hits, such as Jigo Kuman, which you might know as this little movie called The Gate of Hell, a movie that would go on to win the coveted Palme d'Or at the Cannes International Film Festival. Daiei would continue to have success after success, making them constantly step up their production game to be as big in scale as possible. Even Toho, the most prominent Japanese studio at the time, had trouble keeping up. Even though they would find plenty of success in the years after, President Nagata still wanted more. Enter 1963's The Birds, directed by one of the most influential and beloved directors ever, Alfred Hitchcock. The film was unlike anything that had ever come before it and made tidal waves in the filmmaking industry. Seeing that success, Nagata wanted his own movie just like it and decided to finally enter the space that no other studio would dare to go. This project would become an absolute nightmare. <laughs> Giant Horde Beast Nezera was a 1964 horror movie that never came to be. It was about a giant rat infestation taking over the streets of Tokyo and leaving nothing but ruin and devastation in their wake. Uh, but the only devastation left behind would end up being on set because this movie was a complete disaster. 
At first, they wanted to use stop motion rats, but that looked like so they didn't do that. Then they attempted to use people in rat suits, but that was probably just embarrassing. <laughs> so what did they use as a last resort? Well, eventually, they decided to try and use actual rats. And to everybody's surprise, that went swimmingly. Nah, just kidding, it was a catastrophe. The rats went gung-ho, shutting down the production studio after the health department discovered an outbreak of fleas on set. Now, who could have seen that one coming? Needless to say, production was not good, and the film was scrapped. But there was actually a crowdfunded film that recently got a Western release called Nezra 1964. It's a pretty crazy dramatized biopic about the production of Nezra that even features some of the actors from the Gamera franchise. So keep an eye out for that one if you're interested. If not, then there's also Night of Lepus, which is pretty much the same thing. Anyway, with the film being bins, but Daya still having all those resources at their disposal, they decided they were going to try and use it for something else. And this would be the beginning of the film we would come to know as Gamera, the giant monster. But with that said, how he finally came to be is just a bit contended. Most people that worked with Masaichi Nagata would tell you that it was a massive stroke of luck. A story where Nagata, flying back from a film festival in 1965, saw a cloud, or an island depending on who you asked, that he looked at and said, Turtle! Yeah. Damn, son. And thus, Gam- actually not yet, Camera was born. That was until they realized that name was stupid because, hello! And thus, Gamera was born. But the smarties among you probably caught on to the fact that this sounds pretty familiar. For those of you that don't know, right? This is pretty much the exact same story producer Tomoyuki Tanaka had when talking about his inspiration for creating Godzilla. So is this really where Gamera's story begins? Eh, probably not. The more realistic but less flattering story is that Nagata probably maybe ripped off the concept from an up-and-coming filmmaker named Tomio Sagisu when he showed Daie his demo reel. One portion of said demo reel had a stop-motion turtle that would pull in its limbs, spew fire, and fly. Which only vaguely sounds familiar. He obviously wasn't too happy about that when the movie was eventually released. Still, he went on to make the hit show Spectre Man, so at least he had that going for him. But the origin stories don't stop there. There is also a story where the whole idea actually came from Masaichi Nagata's son, Hidemasa. Then there's another story where the idea was basically ripped from screenwriter Nissan Takahashi's story called A Lowly Turtle Flies Through the Sky. And then there's my personal favorite story that apparently came from a stripper who said the idea actually came from a strip cabaret's idea to put, and I quote, naughty spinning turtles on strings. Which is a story I'm gonna choose to believe for nothing aside from my own personal amusement. Regardless of whichever way it was that the monster came to be, Daie would quickly get to work on it. So quick, in fact, that Nissan Takahashi would make a four-page beta script for Nagata in a two-hour lunch. Nagata was sold and ordered a complete script to be made. Thus began the creation of Gamera, the giant monster. Now that Daie was fully committed to making a kaiju movie to go head-to-head -head with Godzilla, they just needed to work on it. Unfortunately for Daie, the process was nothing short of bad. One of Daie's biggest problems was that nobody wanted to touch the damn thing. Many directors were proposed for the project, but they all looked at it as a quote-unquote kiss of death for their careers, so they stayed away. So thanks to that, Daie now had to look for a director that already dropped the ball. And so, director Noriaki Yuasa would become their prime candidate. Yuasa was a relative newcomer to the scene, with the only other film he directed being, and get this, If You're Happy, Clap Your Hands. This movie featured a famous J-pop singer in a starring role that, in my mind, sang nothing but nursery rhymes for two hours. 
The film would bomb big time and leave Yuasa's career in ruins. So considering that nobody else was going to give Yuasa a second chance, he accepted the offer and took on the role as director of Gamera, the giant monster. The movie that would either save his career or end it in flaming glory. But, as said by the man himself, there was not a single day on set that went according to plan. One of the biggest issues that came around was the budget for the movie being slashed, mostly because everybody lost confidence in the movie. So now the crew had to shoot the film in black and white, despite it being 1965 and movies having been in color for years at this point. The budget cut also meant casting took a step down, especially the American actors. Which... There's an unidentified aircraft flying on course 84.27 degrees north latitude. This dude is just reading off the script. Are you kidding me? So the crew had one hell of an upward battle to face. And despite all odds, they managed to finish the movie. And it would be released in Japan on November 27th, 1965. And the film itself was... Pretty interesting. <laughs> it begins as Cold War tensions cause a plane to crash in the Arctic, reawakening a threat unlike anything ever seen before. Well, except for that one other time, but we don't talk about that here. And trying to find a way to stop its rampage. Uh, simply put, this movie was pretty much a ripoff. Instead of really drawing inspiration from Godzilla, it seemed more interested in just making Godzilla, but cooler. Like, this is just plagiarism at some points, man. From destroying cities to war and bomb motifs, and even an experimental weapon developed by the army to be used against God's- Oh, I let that one slip, didn't I? <laughs> against Gamera in the hopes of destroying it. It really feels like they tried to one-up Godzilla in almost every single aspect, and it's pretty hit or miss. Especially when it comes to the Z plan, which is honestly one of the funniest solutions in a movie I think I've ever seen. Ah, we can't kill him, so just build a big ass rocket and send him to the moon! That being said, the moments where this movie does shine are pretty impressive. All things considered, the miniatures and sets were surprisingly good, and the scenes where Gamera went on a destructive rampage had an actual air of menace to them. But that's not all too surprising when you find out who helped with this movie. The visual effects department got significant support from the colleagues of legendary kaiju special effects director, Eji Tsuburaya. Even the score, composed by Tadashi Yamanochi, had ties to Akira Ifakube, the composer for the original Gojira. So despite it being a pretty mixed bag of a film, it was still able to become a big box office hit. Something that, in large part, had a lot to do with director Noriaki Yuasa's vision for the film. While the movie was interesting enough, one major scene defined the film and helped shape it into the franchise it would become. A scene where the destructive giant monster saves a boy named Toshio from imminent death, and lit a spark with children across Japan that now loved Gamera. It was a scene Yuasa fought to keep, and it would make all the difference in making Gamera from just another kaiju movie in the 60s to a staple of the kaiju genre. Just don't think about the fact that Gamera's the whole reason the kid almost died in the first place. <laughs> the film's success led to an overseas adaptation in the US titled Gamera the Invincible. Look, it even had its own theme song. For the most part, the movie was pretty much the same. The most significant differences are the replacements of these schmucks that Daae found on the side of the street for actual actors. They might not be good actors, but they're actors. Read, you ignorant ape! And a more prominent American role with more focus on the Cold War tensions. And of course, the dub. Amazingly, this is one of the few movies I can say that might have actually gotten better with the changes made, but all things considered, that's not saying too much. In the original film, scenes barely had any breathing room. Thanks to that ultra-low budget we talked about earlier, it moved at a breakneck pace. This time around, scenes could breathe a lot more and actually had some cohesion to them. 
Also, did I mention that there's a lot less Toshio in this movie? In the original movie, that kid is an absolute sociopath that nearly killed countless people because he thought his stupid little turtle became a gigantic prehistoric monster in like 30 seconds. Just imagine, I want you to think of all the blood that would have been on this kid's hands because he was a very nice child. Regardless, with the immense success of Gamera both domestically and overseas, Daae saw the opportunity to turn this experiment into a historic run of films that we would come to recognize as the Showa era. With the original Gamera movie creating significant buzz and generating plenty of profit for Daae, Masaichi Nagata would rush the studio into making a sequel. But this time around, Nagata wasn't taking any risks. He bumped the budget up to an A-list production and hired Chuji Kinoshida and Shigeo Tanaka, which were pretty notable names back then, as the new composer and director respectively. Yuasa got moved down to the role of special effects director. Even though his only experience with special effects was in the last Gamera movie, Nagata, being understandably terrified of that prospect, was able to recruit the help of Eji Tsuburaya himself, who at this point was working on a TV show called Ultra Q, a show often cited as the cause for an even bigger kaiju boom and also the predecessor to the legendary Ultraman. Shigeo Tanaka was put in the director's seat because of his experience with these large-scale, big-budget blockbusters. Apparently not seeing what caused their success in the first place, Nagata ordered a darker, more adult-oriented kaiju movie. So Nissan Takahashi would follow through and make the film and its characters a lot more morally gray than the black and white of the film prior, both figuratively and literally. <laughs> which, fair enough to them, was accomplished. The film initially started as Gamera vs. the Space Iceman, a movie where Gamera escapes from the rocket to Mars only to find an Earth that has been taken over by ice aliens that resort to a kaiju-sized Iceman to face off against him. Even though this would never come to be, the remnants of this idea would actually morph into another Dai production, the Dai Majin series. Funny enough, that movie would actually be billed alongside Gamera vs. Baragon as a double feature. So instead of alien ice monsters, they opted to go with Angie. <coughs> Excuse me, I think I got something in my throat. With Baragon, an ice using monster designed as the antithesis of the fire breathing Gamera. Also, he shoots killer rainbows. <laughs> And with that decided, Duel of the Giant Monsters, Gamera vs. Baragon was released only five months after the release of the original. The movie's beginning shows that the Z-Plan has failed because, of course it did. It was only the most smooth brain plan to ever befall humanity, but I digress. And Gamera is now back on Earth, stronger than ever for some reason, and immediately back on his rampage. Elsewhere, a group of men begin an expedition to find the Great Opal, where they find a tribe warning of the misfortune said Opal brings. The group of men really don't give a shit and go out to find it in the Valley of Rainbows anyway. Their search leads one of them to death by a big ass scorpion, the other to get and the last guy to take the Opal back to Japan. Don't worry, he gets eaten later on. Turns out this opal is actually the egg of Baragon, meant to be hidden away to prevent the destruction it would bring. Enter Gamera, both protector and destroyer in this film, to be humanity's last hope against this new foe that grows from the size of a small boulder to like a housing complex in two seconds. The whole idea this time around was to present the classic song of fire and ice, through these two larger-than-life monsters. Oh, by the way, did I mention that the ice monster's weakness is water? Like, do we not see a contradiction here? Wait, so how is Baragon able to weaponize rainbows if he's weak to water? How is he able to breathe? There's water in the air! 
They really didn't think this one through, did they? <laughs> this lady named Karen has a taste for blood. Well, Gamera comes back, while his suit is definitely not on fire. <laughs> and with humanity's help and a comically large diamond, he lures Baragon into a lake where you definitely cannot see Baragon having really long hind legs. And then he's subsequently beaten to death. Upon the movie's release, it was underwhelming both at the box office and critically. Much of this comes from the fact that nobody wanted the series to become more adult-oriented. Even Noriaki Yuasa stated that he felt the melodrama and extra runtime were working against the film's favor. Though sadly, nobody on the crew listened to him since many people built up resentment towards Yuasa because they felt he hadn't put in the work that they did. They even cut the footage he filmed just to spite him. Well, it turns out that he was right. Even the American TV release of the film, War of the Monsters, would have some pretty significant chunks taken out of it. And wouldn't you know it, every Showa-era Gamera movie afterward would gradually become more and more kid-centric. Yuasa knew what he was doing in the first movie. He saw where the landscape of kaiju films was going, and it was all leading to the kids. So with that in mind, the next installment put Noriaki Yuasa back in the director's seat and the special effects seat once again. And Daie wasn't about to take any risk this time. To get some quote-unquote inspiration, they looked over at their largest competitor, Godzilla, and saw the pretty impressive list of names he was billed with. In particular, they looked at King Kong and Frankenstein. King Kong having faced off against Godzilla in 1962, and Frankenstein being the original opponent for King Kong, but being swapped out for Godzilla just before his Toho debut in Frankenstein Conquers the World in 1965. Quick side note, right? Just because it gets confusing. This here is Baragon, which is not the same thing as Baragon. I guess we just ran out of names or something, I, I don't know. <laughs> so Yuasa said, Dracula? And Nissan Takahashi was like, bet. And so he would get to work on a script for a movie titled Gamera vs. Vampire. But that name was generic as hell. So they changed it to Vampira. Eh, I mean, I guess we're getting there. But then they just ditched it all together and instead created perhaps Gamera's most recognizable adversary in 1967's giant monster dogfight, Gamera vs. Gauss. Even though the last movie underperformed, this one was still given a big budget, even if it was cut down by just a little. The producing role would also be passed down to Masaichi Nagata's son, Hidemasa, promising that the series would be taken in a different direction. Considering Yuasa's want to make Gamera a children's franchise, they were just like, plot? Who needs it? And tried to get to the action as soon as possible to pump the kids' brains full of dopamine. The little plot there actually was in the film took inspiration from events happening at the time. The main one being all the sudden eruptions all around the world. So they could build themes around the eruptions and by that I mean... The second is a theme of modernizing Japan, which was based on the account of a farmer having his land taken away to build the Tokyo International Airport. This resulted in other farmers purposefully sabotaging this progress. But in this movie, it's all just a means to an end. And that end is stalling for as much time as possible so that everybody in the village can get hella interest on this bread they're about to get. Real classy stuff. Apparently, this was all included because Hidemasa Nagata wanted to teach kids that there are consequences for evil actions. So don't say potty words unless you want a gigantic vampire bat to slaughter hundreds of innocent people and cause billions of dollars worth of irreparable damage. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> Going back to Gauss, it would retain many vampire-like traits such as being attracted to blood and being weak to sunlight, both of which bring its downfall. After being drawn out with synthetic blood, Gamera would drag the fight on with Gauss until Sunrise would ultimately defeat the creature. Also, Gamera decides to drag Gauss into an active volcano because there's no kill quite like overkill. <laughs> One thing that's worth noting about this movie and the other movies to come is that they're pretty damn violent for kids' movies. 
I mean, not too long into the film, Gauss uses a ray that nearly slices Gamera's arm clean off his body. And later on in the movie, Gamera just decides to rip off Gauss's nasty ass toes. And at the end of the movie, I, I mean, I don't think it's supposed to look like this, but... <laughs> The violence was actually a pretty big draw for these movies though. After all, it's not like the kiddies were going to be able to see anything like that anywhere else. Not to mention, these were just about every kid's dreams realized in a movie. I mean, in this movie, this imp child is rescued by Gamera in the first fight against Gauss. Then everybody decided, why break down the science when we could have the kid explain it? <laughs> And all that, despite him not being able to go one syllable without peaking the audio tracks, bless his heart. <laughs> Needless to say, with the direction back where it needed to be, this movie was a success. But it wasn't without its hardships. Specifically, Yuasa was still not respected by many of his peers. Many in the crew even thought that Yuasa and the lead boy looked kinda similar, which only led to more accusations of favoritism and the like. This didn't seem to phase Yuasa though as he would continue to hold his positions as director and special effects director into the rest of the Showa era, which would continue on with Gamera vs. Space Monster Virus. A little background before we move on to this one. Gamera vs. Gauss actually received money from a company known as UniJapan Film, which would help advertise the film to international markets. This would lead to Daie reaching a deal with American International Pictures, who would have a significant influence on the Gamera films to come. Every Gamera film under this agreement would have to feature an American child, making it more palatable for American audiences. Likely, Daie wouldn't have had to resort to a deal like this under normal circumstances, especially considering their success with the Gamera franchise, but behind the scenes, there was a lot going on. First, there was a lot of lousy spending at Daie, something we'll touch later. And second, Daie felt as though the kaiju boom in Japan was on its last legs. Much of that had to do with the Godzilla franchise supposedly ending with Destroy All Monsters. And third of all, the culture itself was shifting. Japan was rapidly approaching the 70s, meaning that the interest in movies was waning and the rise of TV would soon begin. With all this in mind, Daie figured they couldn't invest too much into Gamera vs. Virus, so they cut the budget by a third of what was given to Gauss and said it was probably the last movie of the franchise. Uh, maybe. <laughs> So, as you can imagine, the making of this film was absolutely horrendous. And the product doesn't fall much behind either. <laughs> it was shot in what must have been a miserable 25 straight days of filming, which obviously took a drastic toll on Yuasa. So what had to be cut down first if they were going to pull this together and make this big dumb turtle movie for kids? Well. It was the runtime. The runtime was just slightly over an hour and 10 minutes long. And even still, a lot of that short runtime was reused footage from the original Gamera movie and Gamera vs. Baragon. The former being incredibly awkward since that's, you know, in black and white. <laughs> they also had like uh, two locations to work with and a handful of sets that they reworked every once in a while just so it didn't look exactly the same every scene. And don't you worry, the plot of this movie suffered plenty too. This movie would be the Gamera series first, but certainly not last, appearance of aliens. Something that had been rapidly becoming a trope in the kaiju genre and wasn't about to stop with Gamera. The movie starts with Gamera attacking this alien spaceship and promptly destroying it, but not before the aliens send a message back to the rest of their home planet. 
But back on our planet, we meet two Boy Scouts. These delinquents mess around with a submarine that was an actual real-life submarine built by the Germans, but we're just gonna bypass that. And even manage to find Gamera underwater. Turns out he's not all that hard to find. This is when the alien reinforcements arrive and attack Gamera with his supposed greatest weakness. Which just so happens to be, and I quote, his unusual and overpowering kindness to human children. Hmm. So the aliens capture the kids in there. Wait, is it really called the Super Catch, right? <laughs> Gamera gets brainwashed and... <laughs> until he isn't anymore and fights Virus. Which is a downright banger of a fight. Especially that really great part where Virus repeatedly stabs Gamera through his shell. Look, you can even see the Gamera goop. While this might be one of the more embarrassing movies in the franchise, that's not the fault of anybody on set. Well, except for maybe the American actors. Jim! Oh, Jim! Jim! Oh, Jim! Oh, Jim! Daya might as well have said, here's a squid costume and a bag of Doritos, good luck! And that's all the team had to work with. And just to add to the list of Daya ass polls, they also staged a fake contest where the public got to decide the name for Virus in magazines like Weekly Shonen. But the Virus name was decided a long time ago. So it was probably more of a publicity stunt than anything. Needless to say, there was a lot of frustration with this movie. So much so that Kojiro Hongo and Yoshiro Kirahara, who were mainstays of the series at this point, made this their last Gamera movie. Even Noriaki Yuasa, the heart and soul of this franchise thus far, was so frustrated that he said he was done. If there was one good thing that we got out of this movie, it's definitely the Gamera March. That's my jam, bro. Over in the States, AIP renamed the film Destroy All Planets. Very subtle, I know. And added an extra 20 minutes to its runtime. Well, Yuasa wasn't a big fan of that, so he made a shorter director cut than the AIP version, but longer than the original. This means that this is pretty much the only entry in the franchise to have three separate versions of it available to watch. And no, it is not worth your time to watch all three versions. Take it from experience. So how do you think this movie that was destined to fail at the box office, something so rushed, something so poorly made, managed to do in the box office? Well, it did gangbusters apparently. Gamera vs. Virus somehow managed to be a big hit once more, and so Yuasa didn't really have an option anymore and just kept going with it. Next, we embark on an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation and Gamera vs. Giant Evil Beast- oh my god, that's a long name. Gamera vs. Giant Evil Beast Giron. In this movie, these kids get transported to an alien world. Like Earth, but on the other side of the sun. Here, they meet two alien ladies. They seem kind at first, but then they try to eat their brains, and that's not very cool. They're trying to do that so they can learn about human culture and assimilate into Earth or something like that. I, I don't know. Not to mention they also house this massive knife monster that makes some gnarly looking space scouse steaks. Eventually, Gamera comes to save the day in style with his acrobatics. and defeats the beast by throwing a missile into Giron's nose hole and setting it aflame. Gamera even manages to fix the ship that got the kids there in the first place so he can take them back to Earth. Don't ask me how. <laughs> Much like Virus before it, Giron was, supposedly, named through a public competition where people got the chance to name Gamera's next adversary. Although Yuasa would go on to say it was staged, so, you know, die. However, unlike Virus, this movie actually got a budget increase. The name Giron came from the Japanese rendering of the word guillotine, but the translation got chopped up there somewhere. <laughs> the actual name for this movie should be Gamera vs. Gion, which is a name you can actually find on some older copies for the film. The whole idea behind Giron was to design a monster out of a weapon. So they got a big knife and made it into a gigantic space shark thing that also happens to shoot shuriken from its snout. 
This is because ninjas and kaiju were hip where now we're wow and how. So why not just fuse both of them and see what we get? He was actually supposed to be a bipedal monster at first before the crew realized that the poor dude inside the suit would probably have a hard time walking around with his center of gravity being somewhere at his head. So he would just stay on all fours and traumatize kids that way. Remember that scene I joked about earlier where Giron chops up the space gauss into steaks? Thanks to that scene, the movie received lots of backlash from parents whose kids were traumatized by gauss being served rare. It might have looked goofy as hell, but the concept was a bit much. Yuasa would actually state that he regretted putting that into the movie. Still, I don't know. Something about watching that thing take a bite out of Gauss and actually going, you stinky, really added to this story for me personally. An extra little side fact for you, the only reason Gauss was used here is that Dae wanted the movie done tomorrow even though they started filming yesterday. So they just looked at what suits they had and painted the thing so it looked like it was at least somewhat different. Like they put in some kind of effort, right? <laughs> With this movie in particular, for one reason or another, a lot of crew members would end up leaving the Gamera oh, franchise, yeah. and leave the remaining crew kind of scratching their heads as to how they were supposed to pull this off. Most notably, the main team of Monster Makers left, before being ultimately replaced by more of Eji Tsuburaya's former underlings. And the production designer had to step down because he hurt his back in an expo, and was replaced by Tomohisa Yano. And from the stories told, it seemed like they maybe didn't have all that good of an idea of what they were doing. For example, many of his designs for suits didn't consider the people you had to, you know, stuff inside them. So you can imagine the collective brick everybody left in their pants when he proposed a flounder design for the monster. Something else worth noting about this movie is the new composer for the series, Shunsuke Kikuchi who would go on to compose for the rest of the Showa era. The scores for the Gamera movies were always pretty good, unless you were the Gamera March, in which case you were legendary. Still, Kikuchi's involvement added some personality and flair to the movies afterward. And the crazy thing is that many of you have probably heard his work before. Kikuchi was also the composer for Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z, which of course I had to sneak in there somewhere. Following up the space adventure would be a more grounded film in Gamera vs. Giant Demon Beast Jiger. They might have had a hard time coming up with original titles. They definitely didn't have a hard time finding bad actors though. Gamera vs. Jiger is definitely one of the more... interesting installments in the franchise. There's a lot going on here that we've never really seen before, and it just makes for a really bizarre story. Gamera vs. Jiger mostly takes place in the real-life 1970 World Expo in Osaka, and they only managed to get a hold of it if they didn't destroy anything in the movie. Although, I'm sure they were tempted. It begins with this guy saying, total gibberish. But the idea is that they cannot take this statue from its spot on Wester Island. Yes, I know unless they want to unleash a very ambiguous evil. So they do exactly that, and release the first lady kaiju of the series, Jiger. And how do I know it's a lady? Well, Jiger uses her tail to practically inseminate Gamera with its parasite-like baby, rendering him completely useless. That sounds more like a male thing when I read that out loud, but you'll just, you just have to trust me on this one. So how is Gamera saved? Well, the two lead children decide to climb into a submarine, go inside Gamera, and fight off the parasite baby somehow? Lucky for them, they discover that low frequency waves mess that baby up, thus allowing Gamera to recover and hilariously crash land. He wins the battle by getting the statue, at the bottom of the sea at this point, and chucking it directly into Jiger's face. Then Gamera just menacingly flies around with Jiger's lifeless body. <laughs> the original name for Jiger was going to be Monster X. No correlation to the one from Godzilla Final Wars. But they ultimately decided against it. On the other hand, AIP thought that sounded sick, and released the film in the West as Gamera vs. Monster X. 
Design-wise, she was meant to be kind of a buffalo-type monster, but from the saliva spears to the hilariously titled Super Ultra Wave to the Tale of Impregnation, which sounds like an Evangelion reference, it really seems like they just made the Swiss army knife of monsters. Daie kind of had an ancient evil shtick going on at the time, considering other releases like the aforementioned Daimajin series and the hilariously titled Yokai Monsters Spook Warfare. It's also fair to say that this movie likely had some inspiration from the 1966 film Fantastic Voyage. Another, more surprising inspiration for this film was pro wrestling. Apparently the suit actors studied pro wrestling matches and used what they learned in the fights. And you can't convince me that's not cool. One of my favorite fun facts about this film is one of the ways it was promoted. You know that little Godzilla vs. Gamera fight that everybody wants? Well, it happened. Kinda. They actually did a whole on-stage fight at the expo to try and really promote this movie. Sadly, there's very little footage or pictures. But here's Godzilla dancing with Giao, so that's cool. Even if it was just a stage thing, it's still pretty insane that it even happened. At this point, Dae felt that Gamera had peaked. In their heads, there was absolutely no way Jiger was going to be a success. Well, it turns out that Gamera vs. Jiger was a success. So they wanted to keep making more and more Gamera movies. But the issue wasn't that Gamera peaked. No, the issue was that Dae peaked as they were completely financially unstable and didn't have the means to support themselves anymore. By this point, television was killing the Japanese film industry. That, and rumors of illegal money spending, meant that they were on borrowed time. So, in response, they decided to dramatically cut the budget for the next film in the franchise, Gamera vs. Deep Sea Monster, Zegra. This next installment features- <laughs> Jesus Christ. This installment features the return of aliens looking to invade the planet, but this time with something of a pollution slant to it. It's worth noting that Godzilla vs. Hedera was released before this movie, so it's fair to say that Daie maybe took some creative liberties from Toho again, but who's to say? I, I don't know. That being said, the film does have its fair share of moments. Like most of the Gamera films to this point, this one begins with the absolutely ear-piercing theme that is the Gamera March, when a bowl of tricks attacks a human moon base. We later learn that this spaceship is called the Zegra Star Spaceship, and it abducts some people. The alien lady inside decides to trigger a magnitude 13 earthquake because we are the ants beneath her boot. Can you imagine how many people wanted her to step on them? One thing leads to another and Gamera attacks the ship, releasing Zegra and making him thick. That's when we get Zegra's speech about how us ugly bags of mostly water are unworthy of our oceans and that a more beautiful, deserving creature, like himself, should have it. Gamera ain't having none of that and just starts beating him up. I'd hate to say that this is the movie where Gamera finally jumped the shark, but this is also the same movie where Gamera plays Zegra's back like a xylophone, so cut me some slack. Then Gamera just burns Zegra to cinders as we get a message about not polluting the oceans, even though I think Gamera just might have torn a hole in the ozone layer. Overall, this is one of the most poorly rated movies in the Showa Gamera series. A series that is not highly rated to begin with, might I add. But again, it really wasn't the crew's fault. They had a lot of obstacles ahead of them and could only do so much. Many things had changed, like Yuasa no longer being a contracted worker for Daie and instead just working on the film as an outside contractor. The staff would regularly have to work overnights and wouldn't be paid overtime. One of the monster fights that was supposed to be in there was cut entirely because of the ever-decreasing time and money the team had to work with. A lot of the film was shot in what might as well have been Gorilla, so the team just set up shop wherever they could, and maybe did some filming of the illegal variety here and there, not to mention the two people they had for the cast. Daie looked at actress Eiko Yanami as the glue that would hold this literal OSHA violation together. <laughs> This was because she was a regular star in several pink films at the time, and figured they'd use her as eye candy. Yuasa would flat out admit that she was only in a bikini to, quote, treat the suffering dads in the audience. So, needless to say, 
The movie and its production were a disaster. So much so that American International Pictures actually passed on Zegra. And the film wouldn't see an American release until 1987. And the hardships don't stop there. Even with the film industry burning down before their very eyes, Dae said screw it and started working on yet another sequel titled Gamera vs. Garasharp. This villain was meant to be Gamera's rival, like how King Ghidorah was Godzilla's. That movie was able to get a good amount of basic work done, until Dae declared bankruptcy, and suddenly closed its doors by the end of 1971. A lot of this had to do with some illegal political contributions, and maybe some people writing themselves some nice fat checks. You know, just the staples a Better Business Bureau is looking for. With all these people being left without a job, and not being warned beforehand, a teensy little riot broke out that saw everything from the Gamera series be completely destroyed, along with a bunch of other irreplaceable Dae trinkets. And that was it. With Dae having lost it all, and everybody else looking for work in the television industry, Gamera would take a little break and not be seen for a few years after. A few years later, Yasuyoshi Tokuma, the founder of Tokuma Shoden, a company most recognized for being the parent company to Studio Ghibli, would revive Dae and put it under the Tokuma Shoten umbrella in 1974. At this point, many that worked on Gamera had already moved on. Notably, Noriaki Yuasa had become an esteemed TV director. Having worked on Dungeons of Orger, a very funny sounding tokusatsu series in 1974, and would later direct the very popular Ultraman 80 in 1980. <laughs> but before he would go on to do that, he would get a knock on the door from Tokuma, who wanted to revive the Gamera franchise. This was because kaiju were beginning to pick up steam again towards the tail end of the 70s, and Tokuma wanted to capitalize. Yuasa accepted and would once again take the director's seat in Gamera Super Monster. Since Godzilla was still dormant and awaiting his return in 1984, Tokuma saw no need to jump into anything and wanted to play it safe. So he opted for more of a highlight reel or a Gamera best of movie, meaning that they were going to be reusing a lot of footage. Footage from every film prior, as a matter of fact. So they had to tie together a plot in a way where they could use every single monster fight up to that point and still have a story that makes sense. So they rebooted the franchise and made a world where Gamera doesn't exist yet and aliens are secretly living on Earth. And with that, they crafted a story where a group of good alien ladies, basically Power Rangers, protect the world from the evil Xanon who attacks with every monster in the series prior. Then of course, we've got a kid back in the lead that gets a pet turtle from the alien lady that he needs to set free so that it can become Gamera and save the day. Why is he singing? Said alien lady is Mak Fumiake, who is actually a pro wrestler for AJW. Sadly, she doesn't get to pile drive anybody in this movie, but it is still nice to see the whole pro wrestling thing expanded in the series. Unfortunately, the film itself is pretty awkward and kinda clunky. Just consider that some of the footage was over a decade old and it's not hard to see why. The film ends with Gamera crashing into the spaceship really awkwardly and seemingly sacrificing himself. Then the alien ladies take the kid for a flight around town. So much for the secrecy, I guess. At least we get this cheeky little Godzilla nod out of it. Evidently, it didn't generate that much of a buzz since the turtle wouldn't see any more releases in Japan for another 15 years. Overall, it isn't anything special, but probably one of the better ways to send off Showa era Gamera. Goofy and kid friendly to the end, just like Yuasa wanted. It was pretty clear that, even though things might have never gone smoothly, he enjoyed working on these movies. He and the other crew members felt that Gamera had become a symbol of their youth. From the lighthearted adventures to the amateur production quality, 
everything screamed this juvenile joy that said crew members remember fondly. This would be the last film Yuasa would direct before eventually passing away in June of 2004. His legacy being his passion and excitement manifesting into a collection of films that inspired children across the nation to chase their own dreams. His movies now live on as a cultural touchstone in an era where the king seemed untouchable. But he proved otherwise. After this film, Gamera would leave us once more as we awaited for his triumphant return. After well over a decade of slumber, it was finally time. In 1984, a new kaiju boom would begin after Godzilla made his long-awaited comeback. Not returning as a monster that did whatever the hell this is, but taken back to its roots as an indomitable force, revamped for the modern age. Heisei Godzilla would regularly make hit after hit in Japan, until 1985 with Godzilla vs. Destroya. Much like the Showa era, it would be a while before any other studio dared to try and take the kaiju throne for themselves. But of course, who better to step up to Toho success than Daie? After Godzilla finished his massively successful run and was killed off in Japan, Toho would hand over the production rights to TriStar Films so they could take a swing at making an American-made Godzilla movie. And we all know how that turned out. So Daie saw a golden opportunity. Without Godzilla looming over their shoulder, Daie decided it was time for Gamera's big comeback. Originally, Gamera was meant to come back to life like he was in the Showa era. Daie CEO Yasuyoshi Tokuma thought the best way to bring him back would be an hour-long kids movie. Luckily, a young filmmaker named Shusuke Kaneko told him, eh, that's stupid, and managed to convince Tokuma that Gamera needed to evolve if he was ever going to make an impact. So with Tokuma on board, Daie would bring together an incredible team of talent that would create some of the most cherished kaiju movies ever made. In charge of this new series would be director Shusuke Kaneko and special effects director Shinji Higuchi. Kaneko was a relatively new filmmaker who may or may not have directed a modestly sized library of pink films in the 80s but we can just forget about that part. He would later direct a favorite in the Godzilla franchise with GMK Giant Monsters All Out Attack, work on the Ultraman Max series, and direct the live action Japanese Death Note movies. Uh, some of those are more beloved than others. My main man Shinaguch though, started out as a modeling assistant for the return of Godzilla. Since then, he's become a big name having worked on many significant projects like Kill a Kill, Neon Genesis Evangelion, Shin Godzilla, and most recently, having directed the new Shin Ultraman film. Aside from the general list of talented names on here, what was probably most important was that the team was made up of kaiju fanatics. People that had grown up on these Showa kaiju movies and wanted to mark their names in this monster's legacy. These two, alongside writer Kazunori Ito, the writer of 1995's Ghost in the Shell film, yeah, it really is that stacked, would get to work on rebuilding Gamera, fundamentally changing him to fit the modern era and presenting him with an all new look, attitude, and story. The one thing that Tokuma would not budge on was that Gamera could not look scary, because he didn't want to traumatize kids with a terrifying looking turtle monster. 
Considering the work these people have done, it, yeah. <laughs> However, they were allowed to go all out with the antagonist. So they decided to revamp the iconic Gauss to take the villainous role once again. And with all that in play, 30 years after the original film, Gamera, Guardian of the Universe, would be released. The film was unlike anything the franchise had seen before. Sure, everybody expected an improved Gamera, but not many people expected to see one of the greatest kaiju movies ever made. As mentioned earlier, Gamera would have a completely new origin. Instead of just being a monster awakened from a Cold War scuffle, he would now be a creation from Atlantis, the last hope designed to protect the world against their other creation, the Gauss. What's so significant about this is how it finally gives Gamera an identity that he didn't quite have before. He was finally finding his own way and no longer following in the footsteps of the monster that inspired him, making him stand out that much more and giving the series a whole new level of credibility in the eyes of the public. The film starts with the discovery of an ominous looking atoll that threatens the passing ships that just so happen to be carrying over a hundred A-bombs worth of plutonium. Curious about the atoll, one of the officers aboard the ship goes out to see what's happening, only to unknowingly awaken the giant Atlantean monster. Meanwhile, Dr. Mayumi Nagamine travels to Himigami Island because of reports of giant birds attacking people, only to discover a ghost town. This is where we first meet the baby Gauss as they expand their attack beyond the island. This leads to a government plan to capture and trap the Gauss in the Tokyo Dome. But Gamera is like, f*** that shit, and kills one of the Gauss while the other two escape. But before all that, a strange comma-shaped metal named Orichalcum was found on Gamera's back that was said to be an ancient metal from Atlantis. The Orichalcum turns out to form a link between Gamera and Asagi Kusanagi, the daughter of the marine officer from the beginning. She also just so happens to be Steven Seagal's daughter, so I figured I'd throw that one in there. Are you always armed? Yes. Right now, if I was to look around this room, would I find an arm of some sort that you've brought with you? Yes. There is a downside to this link though. Whenever Gamera is hurt in battle, Asagi then manifests those same injuries, putting her at grave risk. The final Gauss eventually grows into full size, and after destroying the Tokyo Tower, a favorite in the Gamera series, squares off against Gamera in the film's final fight. Gauss overwhelms him throughout most of the battle, seemingly ending it when Gauss pile drives Gamera from orbit into a refinery. That is until Gamera rises from the flames, consuming said flames, and concentrates the energy into a single massive <laughs> completely eviscerating Gauss in one of my favorite special effects of the franchise. Gamera is victorious. But it's made clear that this is not the end. Humanity has now opened Pandora's box and invited new threats to arise from this devastation. But Asagi knows that when those threats come, Gamera will be there. The film was a massive hit both critically and at the box office. It gained a ton of traction from not only general audiences, but also at many award shows. It's something the Gamera franchise has never even heard of before. <laughs> the film would take home accolades like Best Director, Best Screenplay, and Best Special Effects at the Yokohama Film Festival, and even a nomination for Best Supporting Actress at the Japanese Academy Awards. Also worth praising is Kao Atani, who composed the excellent score for this film and the others in this trilogy, adding an extra layer of grandeur and excitement to an already great film. This movie made tidal waves in not only the kaiju scene, but the Japanese film scene as a whole. In many people's opinions, even surpassing the quality of the Heisei Godzilla films, and somehow at a third of the cost. And considering just how good this movie looks, that's just insane. 
To say this movie was impressive would be a massive understatement, since it still holds up incredibly well today. This would be the first time the Gamera franchise would see the use of CGI for scenes of him flying and in some other fighting sequences. This use of live action and CG animation together was considered pretty innovative in Japan back then, which had only usually seen one or the other. With the immense success of the first installment, it was a given we'd be seeing Gamera again. But this time, Tokuma gave Kaneko free reigns to do whatever the hell he and the team wanted. And they even ended up getting a budget increase for the film, which pure insanity. So the team got hard to work on Gamera 2 with a new goal in mind. They wanted to use this movie as a stepping stone, a means to broaden the scope of what a kaiju movie could be. To make something that not only kaiju fans would enjoy, but something that would go beyond and amass the interest of those worldwide. And so, a year after the release of Guardian of the Universe, Gamera 2, The Attack of Legion, would be released on July 13th, 1996. This film diverged even further than before, taking things to a whole new level. Gamera would get a slightly more menacing redesign, the film's atmosphere is a lot more horrific, and the new villain brought with it a whole new air of menace, making the stakes higher than ever in what many people put in the top two of the entire Gamera franchise. The film takes place roughly a year after the events of Gamera Guardian of the Universe. The world is still reeling from the aftermath and coming to terms with the revelation that monsters are real. Gamera has seemingly vanished, not having been sighted since his fight against the Gauss. Everything seems calm for a while. That is until a f meteor slams into Japan because, of course, inside the meteor is a deadly new enemy, the likes of which have never been seen before. Legion. A kaiju collective that Wikipedia describes as a race of insectoid extraterrestrials. I was hoping for a little bit more than that, but I'll take what I can get. And they are so ungodly that they're named after a demon, bro. <laughs> These guys are easily the most intense and horrific monsters to be put in a Gamera film, completely blowing the Gao stakes out of the water. In their goal to expand their species, they regularly find themselves doing things like Murder, conquering entire cities, more murder. Oh, oh, Jesus. The city of Sapporo finds itself as their first target, encasing the city in their pod, until Gamera emerges from the sea and foils their plan. So the Legion decide to show him what and kick his ass. I'm not joking about this intense imagery. The Legion Queen would then emerge from the ground, leading her army to the next target, Sendai. However, a regrouped Gamera emerges right before to stop them, only to once again get completely sh But right before the pod can spread its seed, ugh, Gamera is able to knock it over, causing a Having lost their main line of defense, the Japan Special Defense Forces set up around Tokyo, incidentally attracting Legion. The Legion quickly managed to get through their defenses and head into Tokyo to plant yet another pod. Asagi, determined that Gamera has not been defeated, goes to Sendai, where she finds people praying for the monster's return. At the cost of her link with Gamera, the Orichalcum is destroyed. Now revived, he immediately heads towards the ruinous swarm. In their final bout, the Legion Queen and Gamera face off as the military takes care of the Legion soldiers. The battle is close, but Gamera emerges victorious after he siphons mana from the earth and unleashes a devastating <laughs> And while Gamera has yet again saved the day, the people watching start to become concerned. They have just witnessed the sheer might of Gamera firsthand, and had to question what the outcome would be if Gamera saw humankind as the enemy. Like the film before, Gamera 2 Attack of Legion was another success, 
again getting immense praise, and making 800 million yen at the box office. Which, while not Godzilla numbers, was still an incredibly impressive number to rake in. The film would win the esteemed Nihon SF Taisho Award that year, which was pretty big considering it's an award with nearly every science fiction related media in Japan in the running. That includes TV and books. And it was the first kaiju movie to ever win that award. So it's fair to say that the team's efforts and goals were not in vain. Also, this has nothing to do with Gamera's evolution, but ADV, who made the English dub for this movie, also made some of the best gag reels for these movies, and I share them every chance I get. Holy crap! Emergency! Permission to ship my pants! They somehow managed to surpass the standard of what a kaiju movie could be while clearly having a lot of fun while making the film. You can see their determination to make the best film possible, no matter how demanding their ideas were. That said, massive props to all the suit actors in these movies. They don't get nearly enough credit for all their work, and these movies just wouldn't be possible without them. You can also kind of tell it's not exactly an easy job to do. Hot, any, any other emotions you have about this? No. You'd rather be out of it, right? Yeah. Okay. Feel like breakdancing? No. So with Gamera 2 now in the books, it was then time to look onward to the final installment of the Heisei era. With the acclaim and box office numbers Gamera gained in his second go around, Kaneko and his team were once again given the green light to start working on the next installment. The team, once again, wanted to make something even bigger and better than before. And part of that process involved getting new actors. One of the most notable was up and coming actress Ai Maeda, who plays the character of Ayana Hirasaka. Maeda is most well known for her roles in the Battle Royale films, A Small Part in Kill Bill, and even GMK Giant Monsters All Out Attack. Also of note is prolific actor Toru Tezuka, who stars in movies like the 2009 Kamen Rider, a personal favorite of mine in Takashi Miike's Ichi the Killer, and of course Shin Godzilla because it feels like everybody and their mom starred in that movie. Kaneko would also decide to write for the film alongside Kazunori Ito, while still being the film's director, further evolving the genre with an even meaner Gamera redesign, seriously, a turtle monster has no right looking that badass, and crafting a story about grief and hardship that set a new standard for kaiju stories to follow. This making what is likely the most captivating entry the franchise has ever seen. Three years have passed since the Legion were defeated. The world has become overrun with the threat of Gyaus, a threat that has led people to live their lives in fear of the skies above them. This film mostly follows Ayana Hirasaka, a girl whose parents' lives were tragically lost in the events of Guardian of the Universe. Because of this, she harbors a bitter hatred for Gamera, a monster she believes to be an evil spirit. Leaning back into the final words of the last film, Gamera in this film is Earth's protector and nothing more. Meaning that when Gamera shows up to get rid of the Gauss and Shibuya, the 20,000 human lives he took as collateral were of no importance to him. As this happens, Ayana finds herself in the village temple and befriends an ancient creature known as the Ryusei Cho, the harbinger of the apocalypse. Ayana would name the creature Iris and protected it as it grew to become a true monster. A monster that eventually began to absorb people, including Ayana herself. That's when the shrine's protector, Moribe, comes in and helps release her from Iris's cocoon. The monster would then go on a frenzy, looking for her to complete the fusion. Gamera attempts to stop this, and eventually, the two monsters find themselves dueling in a fiery Kyoto, in what is probably meant to be the most dramatic looking thing in the franchise by a landslide. Seriously, just look at how badass this looks. Iris completely overwhelms Gamera, 
leaving it to attempt to join with Ayana again. But she would come to her senses after Moribe returns to try and save her. But it's too late, and Iris completes the fusion. She begins to have visions while inside of Iris that show that Gamera perhaps wasn't at fault for her family tragedy as it once seemed. Gamera then comes back, punching a hole through Iris's chest, but immediately gets overwhelmed again. With his arm pinned against a wall and the decisive blow coming his way, Gamera decides to burn his arm off and gather the energy from Iris' attack to clock him with a massive- <laughs> Gamera then puts down Ayana, leaving her questioning why Gamera would save her after all that's happened, after all that she's done. Gamera then steps out from the battle ruins and into the blazing Kyoto. He then looks to the sky and lets out a roar as a horde of Gauss make their way to attack. Seriously, such a badass ending. <laughs> This film was a monument to how far filmmakers could take the kaiju genre, making $15 million at the box office and becoming beloved in not only the East, but also in the West. To put this all into perspective, right? This beat out numerous different Heisei Godzilla movies, including The Return of Godzilla, Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah, and Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla at a time when kaiju fatigue was already setting in. So this already impressive number just meant that much more. Beyond being a great kaiju movie, it was just a great movie in general. The filmmakers captured lightning in a bottle with a film that amazed kaiju fans and regular moviegoers alike. Delivering rich characters, big themes, and special effects that you couldn't get anywhere else. At least not altogether, for sure. When people think of their favorite kaiju movie, many people think of Gamera 3. It was so loved, in fact, that there was a notorious fan-made sequel titled Gamera 4 Truth in 2003, which even got Yukijiro Hotaru to reprise his role as Osako. Although the only footage we have is of a Japanese TV commercial, it's still crazy to think that people were so invested in this series that they saw the last moment in Gamera 3 and said, Oh, I'm gonna finish that. The really interesting part about all of this is that the director of this fan film, Shinpei Hayashiya, would actually go on to direct his own kaiju movies. Movies like Reigo King of the Sea Monsters, Raiga God of the Monsters, and most recently, God Raiga vs. King Oga. And all of this is thanks to his Gamera project that took off and got the film industry's eyes on him. It really is a testament to the work put in over the years to make this franchise as spectacular as it is. And a lot of this is thanks to director Kaneko and the talented Shinji Higuchi, whose acclaim to fame would only continue to grow. This team was able to turn something that many viewed as a niche genre for children into an undeniable masterpiece. And I can't begin to express just how much the team behind the Heisei trilogy had to do with that. Having crafted one of the most masterful kaiju trilogies in history and making a platform for everybody involved to grow. Even if they were just throwing beans at each other, like it was amazing. After the third installment, it was time for many in that team to move on. They had poured their hearts and their souls into this monster and decided to let him rest once again as they continued to find success in their careers. So Gamera would once again lay dormant until he'd come back for one last time.
Many years had passed since Gamera 3, and a lot had changed. The president of Daiei Pictures, Yasuyoshi Tokuma, had passed away in September of 2000. Daiei itself had been acquired by Kadokawa Pictures, a company known for its big budget blockbusters from the 1970s to the early 1990s. The company and its president, Haruki Kadokawa, were looked at as having saved the struggling Japanese box office when TV was dominating and pink films were rampant, and they would only continue to grow with each passing year, always looking for the next big picture to release. Well, they decided for that Gamera's 40th anniversary, they were going to bring him back. Before becoming the movie we know, Gamera the Brave went through many different iterations. At first, it was going to be the dream movie we'd been waiting for for decades. Gamera vs. Godzilla. But Toho thought that Daiei was just trying to mooch off the Godzilla name, so they didn't go through with it. Ah, <sighs> what could have been? So the project fell to the wayside until Takashi Miike's The Great Yokai War, a movie about a young boy fighting creatures from Japanese mythology, ended up becoming a hit. So Katakawa Daiei saw the formula of kid plus monsters here, and decided to take that on to their next movie. The next Gamera project. However, many within the production team, specifically the executive producer, felt that bringing Gamera back was... Kinda stupid. The kaiju fatigue at this point had really set in hard, and people were becoming really disinterested in the idea of seeing another monster movie for the fourth time that year. And that's mostly thanks to Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah's success. So movie studios began making new monster movies about every two to three days. Like, raise of hands, who here remembers giant monsters appear in Tokyo? Or how about Orochi the Eight-Headed Dragon? And I'm not even gonna touch those full moon movies out of fear that I'll contract something. So, needless to say, this was an extremely prolific time for the kaiju genre. Probably too prolific. As ticket sales for these movies started significantly declining in the early 2000s. By the time 2004's Godzilla Final Wars came out, a film celebrating Godzilla's 50th anniversary, that it flopped at the box office despite it being a banger of a movie. Come on, man, I ought to be talking for five minutes. Five minutes, five seconds, doesn't freaking matter, because I'm going to bust you through Even though all the warning signs were there, Karokawa Daiei continued anyway and began work on Gamera the Brave. This film had a little bit of a lost identity, partially being a successor to Gamera 3, but at the same time kind of being something you'd see in the Showa era. That's because this movie's script was supposedly based on the original script for Guardian of the Universe. Which, if you recall, was going to be more of the baby stuff. <laughs> this movie begins in 1973, with a fight between Gamera and a horde of Gauss. Yeah, like, like that, but no. This all while people from the village below flee to safety. Gamera, being overwhelmed by the Gauss, self-destructs and sacrifices himself to get rid of them. We then flash forward to 2006, as one of the attack survivors, Kyosuke Aizawa, looks upon the ruins reflecting on that day. This while visiting his recently deceased wife's resting site with his son, Toru. Toru's dad is usually busy running a restaurant on his own most days, which leads Toru to spend time with his friends. Most notably, the girl next door, Mai, and his other friends Katsuya and Ishimaru. One day on the beach, he follows a shining red light to find a strange red stone, and an egg containing a baby tortoise. A tortoise with a strange red engraving on his plastron. So he decides to take the tortoise home, despite his dad's strict no pets policy. He hands the red stone to Mai as a good luck charm, as he recently discovered of her upcoming surgery. He names the baby tortoise Toto after the nickname his mother gave him. 
It wouldn't be much longer until this tortoise suddenly started showing off his Gamera-like abilities in some scenes that have no right to be this cute. <laughs> Even giving us a little homage to Gamera vs. Giron when Toto shoots a little fireball at a Sentoku knife, it's fantastic. Well, Toto suddenly starts growing at an incredibly rapid pace, so Toru and his friends decide to hide him in a shack so that Toru's dad doesn't find a comically large tortoise in his room. Shortly after, Toto disappears, and a new kaiju, Zaidus, shows up on a rampage. This is when a bigger Toto shows up to fight against this new threat. Despite him being smaller and weaker than Zaidus, he manages to just narrowly defeat him, for the time being. Injured in the fight, Gamera is captured by the government for them to experiment on him and his healing. Zaidus would then attack the complex where Toto is being held, leading to their rematch. Having had a successful surgery, Mai tries to get the red stone back to Gamera. She passes it on to multiple children running through the rummage of the kaiju battle until the red stone finds its way to Toru who gets stopped by his father, who already suffered the trauma of loss and doesn't want it to happen again. But he gets over that pretty quick and helps Toru get the stone to an overwhelmed Toto, just on the verge of defeat. Now that he's juiced, Gamera defeats Zetus by shoving a massive fireball down its... The government then tries to intervene again once the battle is over, but they're stopped by the children that help Toto, forming a blockade as he flies away for one last time. Sayonara. Gamera. Unfortunately, the executive producer's fears were right, and Gamera the Brave was considered a major box office flop. Being made off an apparent budget of 1.5 billion yen, which for reference is roughly how much Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah made at the box office, the film only made back 410 million yen. However, it was received pretty well with many fans looking at this movie as one of the most charming in the franchise. Plus, the background behind this movie is pretty fun too. The crew for Gamera the Brave were mostly a bunch of newcomers to the kaiju genre. Director Ryuta Tasaki was really the only one with some experience in this field, having worked on the Kamen Rider and Power Rangers franchises. And with so little experience on board, there came plenty of complications. One of my favorites being all the problems with the baby tortoise on set. As you can imagine, trying to make a baby tortoise follow directions wasn't exactly easy. They had to keep reshooting scene after scene because the poor thing couldn't stop falling asleep mid-shoot. Another great story from this movie was a hoax about a massive 500-year-old turtle being found in the Amazon, which was just the big prop they used for Toto. <laughs> But because it caught on online, they started taking it everywhere, especially press events, just to get some more attention. Another fun fact about this movie comes in the roar. For those of you that have seen the movie, you'll know that Gamera's trademark roar is nowhere to be found here. Instead, they have a bunch of generic roars including a roar that can be found in the 1976 King Kong remake. <laughs> Media Blasters, who were set to bring the film to the West, wanted to go out of their way to fix that and put the original Gamera roar in there instead. But Katakawa decided against it, leaving the film to be awkward across every market. <laughs> the original plan, after what Katakawa assumed would be Gamera the Brave's success, was to bring back the Daimajin series with another movie but it was instead changed to a TV series we'd come to know as Daimajin Kanan. And with that, Gamera's last film to date was released. However, there was news back in 2014 of Katakawa Daie working on a new Gamera project for his 50th anniversary. 
And we actually got to see what they were working on at the 2015 New York Comic Con. There, we got to see a really great looking concept trailer using a CGI camera that seemed to follow the same grittiness of the Heisei trilogy. Unfortunately, nothing would ever come of this as director Katsuhiro Ishii would later confirm that this was meant to be nothing more than a concept trailer. But if you ask me, it was more likely an attempt from Kadokawa Daie to see how much interest there was in a new Gamera film. While there might have been plenty of interest from fans, I mean, just look at that view count, some sources state that investors weren't so interested after the Braves numbers. And that's a real shame since the same year would see the kaiju genre reinvented again with Hideki Anno and Shinji Higuchi's Shin Godzilla. Seeing Gamera get that same treatment would have been an absolute spectacle to see. Regardless, this would be the last time we'd really get to see Gamera in a meaningful way. And we haven't seen much of him since. But despite that, Gamera has lived on. Throughout his time, he's been the one monster that could consistently compete with the untouchable king when nobody else dared to take a swing. Having started out as nothing more than a Godzilla ripoff, it's incredible to see the heights he's gotten to. From cameos in series like The Simpsons and Dragon Ball, to getting a species of Cretaceous-era turtle named after him, and of course we can't forget the real modern-day Gamera, he has evolved over the years to mean so much more than just another monster. His legacy would start as the series in the Showa era that many kids adored and were inspired by. It was a series that helped fuel their dreams to create and make something just like it, leading to that same generation of people, of fans, to reinvent the monster to grow up with them in the Heisei era. An era that was universally praised by everyone and would make shockwaves in the Japanese film industry. And then, a few years later, it would all go full circle when those adults, now with families of their own, renewed their love for the monster and got to show their kids the Gamera they grew up with. Gamera was able to go beyond the desolate path it was set to take and become a staple of the kaiju genre. And it's all thanks to those that put their all into the monster no matter what. Gamera's legacy may have started out as a franchise that, not so apologetically, wore its inspirations on its sleeve, but would become a beast of its own, an undeniable icon, and a monster that would change the lives of dozens of people forever. Gamera is proof that no matter who you are, no matter where you started from, you can always change your destiny. All you need to do is believe in yourself and take destiny into your own hands. This is the story of the monster that reached the heights of the unreachable Godzilla. The monster that changed Japanese cinema forever and the monster that inspired hundreds of thousands of people to dream and set their own paths for themselves. This is Gamera. Hello everybody and thank you for watching the history and evolution of Gamera. I pretty much just finished right now with editing the video, so I'm tired. <laughs> I'm, I'm so happy it's out there, I'm so happy it's done and I hope you all enjoyed it. It's been a long five years since the last history and evolution of video, but I hope you all enjoyed it. I put my heart and soul into it, so I, I really hope it came out well. I, I'll find out after this comes out. Hopefully it's good. <laughs> but anyway, I just wanted to come on here and thank you all for your patience, because like I said, it was 
five years and you guys did not have to wait that long for that but at the same time I wanted to make sure this is the best video I can make it be I threw in I learned animation for this I learned a whole bunch of new editing techniques for this I tried doing a whole bunch of new stuff for this and I hope it came out well if not I'll try some new things but anyway it's just it's just one thing I really want to make sure it came out as well as I possibly could make it so I hope you guys understand that thank you all for your patience again I really appreciate it. And that being said, I swear to you, it will not take this long for the next big project to come out. I've got a lot in mind, and hopefully it should be a lot sooner than five years. I honestly, I'm, I'm stuck behind this camera. I don't know what to say. I hate looking at this camera. I hate it. I don't know if my anxiety is showing off. I'm pretty sure it is. Um, I, I don't know what to do. But regardless, right? Um, I'm just curious to hear what you guys think, whether it be on here, on Twitter, anywhere you guys want to tell me how I did. How you guys think the video came out let me know I'd be, I'd be really appreciative to hear that but nonetheless there are some things I want to talk about real quick because hey I got you right here you've already been here for an hour 30 something like that so why not get just keep you for a little bit more <laughs> firstly uh, I put a little companion piece of this video out on my second channel which I hope to be uploading to more as well as live streaming more if I can get in the habit of doing that but it's essentially just a gamma movie tier list so if you're interested in watching that go ahead and check that out I probably put that I, I don't like doing the whole youtuber point thing but I think it's there I don't know um, check it out I guess it probably should be fun I hope I'm probably recording it right after this secondly my friend Joe just put out a video recently about him tier listing all the Marvel movies and he did such an amazing job at it and I feel like he hasn't gotten the views he deserves for it so I'm gonna promote it here where I hope to get some attention to it um, check that out as well it's really fantastic it's really funny I'm in fact jealous at the factor that he made that in like a month or two while I'm trying to like do this video in like a year and it didn't come out nearly as good so please check that video out it's fantastic I'd really appreciate it if you did and of course we gotta show the patreon because you know big boys gotta eat so the whole time I was making this video I was throwing on like drafts and stuff like that of this video onto the patreon page early drafts of the Showa era the little opening bits uh, the little title cards in between to show like tests of them um, so if you guys want to see early access stuff like that and not have to wait, you know, an entire five years to actually see parts of the video, that'd be a great way to do it. I'm also throwing on like behind the scenes stuff, hopefully soon and other stuff like that, polls, videos, ideas, and, and things like that to see what you guys are interested in seeing. So hopefully if you guys are interested, check out that page. I'll put a link in the description. I'd help. It helped me a lot. And lastly, I, I can't just express this enough. Thank you guys. Uh, since the history and evolution of Godzilla, the support that has been shown on this channel has been just outright amazing. And it always means the world to me whenever I see you guys interacting or talking with each other, discussing videos, anything like that that I've done. It's always amazing to see like the community we built around this stuff and it's always really cool to see the next video drop and see what people are thinking about and how people are talking about the actual product and stuff like that. So, I don't know. I, I, it's, 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 it's really cool that after all this time I'm finally dropping this video that I've been working my ass off for so I just hope you guys enjoy it I could I hope so because if, if it's bad if you guys do not like it I'm gonna be so upset because it, it, it really did take a long time to do <laughs> but seriously thank you all for watching I can't express how much it means to me that you guys sat through an entire hour and a half long of me being a little brat and talking about the stupid stuff that, you know, just big turtle. And it means the absolute world to me. So, seriously, it would not be possible without you guys and your continued support. It would not be possible if you guys didn't constantly push me to do better. You guys are absolutely amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And again, I promise I'll be doing a lot more. This video, or this year has been a little dry overall with the, the content because I put a hard focus on this. Because every time I tried doing anything else, it just got completely sidelined because I can't multitask with three jobs. But anyway, ah, I'm ranting at this point. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. And I'll see you all in the next one. Take care.